Good morning, and welcome to our Linda Road Church family and to anyone who might be visiting with us. I'm John McCarthy, and this is Lesson 10 of a study of the life of Joseph based off of material by Max Cicado called You'll Get Through This. It's good to see you all here this morning, even again virtually, and we're looking forward to this class. We're looking forward, we are looking forward to worshiping in the next hour, and we're looking forward still with plans to uh, come back together and worship together on July 5th. And I pray that you're continuing to look forward to those um, plans as well. Please continue to pray for, for those plans. Um, the deacons, the elders are meeting later on today. Plans are moving forward. I want to let you know uh, how much I appreciate um, my fellow deacons and, and, of course, the elders here at, at Linda Road as well. Anyway, let's begin with a, with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this opportunity to study your word again. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that we can take from the life of Joseph. What a, um, what a great example he is for us, how, how, steadfast he trust, how steadfastly he always trusted in you, Lord. Pray that you would bless our study this morning as we consider um, the difficulties that, that Joseph had with his, with his family, with his father's household, and how he now has to deal with them again. Thank you again for hearing our prayer and for caring for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, let's review again what I've been calling a framework for hard times. You'll get through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick. But God will use this mess for good. In the meantime, don't be foolish or naive, but don't despair either. With God's help, you will get through this. If we were to fit last week's lesson into our framework, it would probably fit best with the idea of not despairing. Last week, we discussed how Joseph was starting a family and how his gratefulness to God was still present even after years of hardship. Joseph names his firstborn Manasseh, which sounds like making to forget. And he said, for God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. 
Joseph names his second son Ephraim, which sounds like making fruitful. And he said, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. So God is still in the front of Joseph's mind. He is the Lord of Joseph's life, and Joseph glorifies God when naming his sons. Now we discussed the importance of being thankful in all circumstances. This will keep us from despairing and giving to self-pity and depression. April headlines now seem a little bit more distant, but here's an article posted on the Chicago Tri Tribune's website about six things I'm grateful for during the stay-at-home order. The world recognizes the importance of gratitude and thanksgiving, and as Christians, we realize that the target of that thanksgiving should be God. We reviewed verses such as Philippians 4.8, where Paul writes that we should present our requests to God, but to do this with thanksgiving. And Joseph gives us a great example of someone who persevered through some of the most difficult circumstances, and gratitude was part of his story. For this morning, I want you to think for a minute about the relationships that you have with your family. Would you consider those relationships healthy? Now, this is a very personal and introspective question. Unlike our other discussion questions, probably shouldn't post this one in the comments. Um, but we're talking about family wounds this morning. And sometimes those wounds start in our childhood when we're young and our reality is defined by the household that we grew up in. Sometimes these wounds come later. Family relationships can be some of the most challenging relationships we face in our entire lives. Now, I hope you had a stable and healthy childhood with a mom and a dad that loved each other and were there for you. I know, personally, I've been incredibly blessed to be raised in such a household. It wasn't perfect, but my parents served each other and their family and did their best to keep us safe, healthy, and loved. Likewise, my wife and I are doing our best to care and love our children, to raise them to know and to love God in a safe and supportive household. But I'm sure that for many of you, you carry scars from your childhood. It happens, and sadly, it happens often that those who are supposed to protect and love their children end up hurting them instead. When hurt comes from within your family, it's a terrible betrayal. If you've struggled with your family, either in your childhood or as an adult, please know that you're not alone. Sadly, Genesis is a, is a record of many family wrongs. Let's review some of these. It starts in the garden. First of all, Adam blaming Eve right off the bat for eating the fruit. Uh, the blame game starts early. And then Cain kills Abel. I mean, it didn't take long to have the first murder. And sadly, it was brother killing brother. There were other family scandals as well in Genesis. Abraham lies about his wife, Sarah, twice, claiming her as his sister instead of his wife. Or how about Rebecca and Isaac playing favorites with their kids? Rebecca favored Jacob and Isaac favored Esau. Not playing favorites with your kids is like parenting 101, and it led to problems. Jacob deceives his father Isaac, and Esau is suddenly out to kill him. Or how about all the family issues in Jacob's household as we've been discussing this quarter? Jacob plays favorites with his wives, <coughs> and then his children, leading to such hurt and jealousy between brothers that they eventually throw him into a pit and sell him as a slave. So where is Joseph by the time we come to Genesis chapter 42? If you have your Bibles, that's what we'll be this morning. Genesis chapter 42. By the time that chapter starts, the famine is underway. So Joseph has been second in command, kind of like a prime minister uh, of Egypt, for at least seven years now, the, during the years of plenty. And during this time, he started a family, and he's established himself in Egypt. He's got resources. I imagine he could have reached out to Pharaoh about his family. And we see later on that Pharaoh is excited to welcome Joseph's family. Um, but at this time, it seems like Joseph was more willing to leave his family in the past. Maybe at this time, it was easier to not think about them. Or maybe it was just too painful to think about them. Remember when he names Manasseh again, he says, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. Maybe you're in the same boat today. And it's, it's sad. It's, it's tragic. When there's conflict or hurt in a family, the, those days of silence between us, they can quickly turn into years since you've last spoken to a loved one or to a family member. Maybe the distance is just easier when facing the hurt or the conflict. So Joseph's willing to let time pass. And maybe he's still thinking about his family. Maybe he's pushing those thoughts out of mind. But then one day, his brothers suddenly appear. Let's pick it up in verse 6. In the first six verses, Jacob tells the sons to go to, uh, 
to Egypt, starting in verse 6. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. So we have to imagine Joseph's perspective on this. He's doing his job distributing food during the famine. He's probably got multiple attendants, secretaries, translators, guards. I imagine it's a very busy time for Joseph. I imagine he's working really hard and, and it's just kind of a, a busy, very business-like scene. Maybe you could imagine him saying something like, okay, show the next group in. Uh, I imagine his calendar is full of appointments. And here come 10 men. Maybe he hears Hebrew first. Maybe that's what perks up his ear. Maybe it's the number of the men that sticks out. And then it hits him. Now, if, it was like, if, if he was anything like me, maybe a cold sweat starts at the back of his neck. He realizes it's his brothers. Let's read uh, the next few verses. Let's read verses uh, 7 through 11. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? He said. They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. They said to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. All right, there's a lot going on in these verses that we need to unpack. First of all, Joseph recognizes his brothers. Now, let's talk about the passage of time here. There's now some 20 years, they are now some 20 years older. That's 13 years when Joseph was in hardship, plus seven years of plenty before the famine. They've gone from being young men in their 20s and 30s to older men in their 40s and 50s. They're grayer, they're more worn by time. They probably still, they're probably still dirty and grimy from the long journey from Canaan. But they don't recognize him. Now, why is this? Well, first of all, they don't expect this to be Joseph, clearly. So they're not looking for him here. But he also looks different. He's not a 17-year-old boy anymore. He's now a 37-year-old man. He's also Egyptian to them. He's not speaking Hebrew. He's letting the interpreter do that. And as a funny thought, I was, I was wondering, you know, could the interpreter have just spoiled the whole thing? Like, hey, Joseph, Hebrew, you don't need me. Can I take a lunch break? But, uh, you know, I don't think interpreters spoke out of turn back then. Probably a good thing. Uh, instead, again, he's Egyptian to these men. He now has an Egyptian name, Zephanath uh, Panea. He's dressed like an Egyptian. I was going to say walk, walk like an Egyptian. It sounds like a song. Uh, he's, he's shaved like them. He probably, he's probably very clean shaven on his face and, in, and his head. Uh, he probably has on one of those fancy Egyptian wigs that were all the rage. Um, and then that, you know, that fashionable Egyptian black eyeliner. Yeah, it was, a, it was a thing. But it's amazing to think about the differences in appearance. And Joseph, in, in a sense, he's in disguise to his brothers just by being Egyptian. Now. Joseph also remembers the dreams of his youth in verse 9. He's now realizing that these dreams have been fulfilled. Now, these dreams weren't difficult to interpret when he was 17. Not for him, not for his brothers or his dad. But for 13 years, these dreams seemed incredibly unlikely. But you have to believe those dreams stuck with him because they come to his mind now in a flash. And it says he treats them harshly. He speaks to them harshly. So what's going on here? Why the harsh treatment? First of all, I don't think uh, Joseph's happy to see them. Last time he saw his brothers, they threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery. And now the tables have turned. In verses 12 through 17, uh, we see that they plead their case, and they actually say that, uh, you know, they're all sons of one man, um, there's still a, a younger brother at home, referring to Benjamin, and one is no more, referring to Joseph. Um, and then he, uh, it says in verse 17, he, he put them all together in custody for three days. He actually has them arrested. Uh, in some ways, he's kind of mirroring what happened to him in the past. He's throwing them into a pit. Maybe it's the same prison that, that he spent several years in, too. Now, this is a serious trial for Joseph. Maybe even the hardest test of his life. I mean, by comparison, dealing with this famine, famine, managing all these resources, maybe it was relatively easy for him. I mean, 
let's talk about his other trials. Denying Potiphar's wife, this was a constant issue, but he had made up his mind to not sin. And then when he was called before Pharaoh to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, he was the one, as we discussed, that was calm, cool, and collected. But now he's faced with his family and the source of all of his pain. How many nights had he struggled with how his brothers had wronged him? How many trains of thought came uh, back to that darkest of days for him? In Genesis uh, chapter 42, verse 18, he comes up with a plan. First of all, he lets them out of prison after three days. And then he demands that they bring back their other brother, that is Benjamin, to prove their sincerity. Let's take a look at uh, verses uh, 21 through 24, because we see that Joseph's brothers are actually thinking of him as well. Reading down in verse 21, Then they, that's Joseph's brothers, said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us, and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Then he went away from them and wept. And as he returned to them and spoke to them, and he returned to them and spoke to them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. So this kind of sounds like a little bit of, of a karma argument from the brothers. The brothers now believing that bad things are happening to bad people. But if we put that aside, Joseph hears this discussion, and it's a real gut punch to him. His brothers show some remorse for their actions, or at least claim some guilt from it. It's, it's too much for Joseph to take. And this is the first time that he has to step away and, and weep and collect himself. It's hard to imagine the emotional turmoil that Joseph is going through. So what can we learn from Joseph's life here? Well, if you're dealing with family pain, a couple of thoughts. I think, first of all, you have to ask yourself, is, is this impacting my Christian walk? Is my uh, relationship with my family affecting it in a negative way? Uh, sadly, there are a number of ways that past hurt can impact your future. There are, there are several studies and just sad statistics about victims of child abuse and neglect um, such as that they are 59% more likely to be arrested as a juvenile, 28% more likely to be arrested as an adult, and 30% more likely to, uh, to uh, commit uh, a violent crime. That's from DoSomething.org. Even worse, it's estimated that about 30% of abused and neglected children will later abuse their own children. That's from the American SPCC.org. Now, honestly, I don't understand uh, this cycle, the cycle of abuse, but abuse... And, and pain, it does damage. It's been put this way. It was put this way in the study guide. Hurt people hurt people. And thankfully, many people will go the other way and will never perpetuate abuse themselves. But what about when that hurt, what about when it turns to hate? You have to wonder how Joseph felt about his brothers at this point. Did he hate them? It's the sad thing about hate is that hate hurts you. It hates the one who is it hurts the one that is hating. Hate hurts you. The civil rights activist Medgar Evers put it this way. When you hate, the only person who suffers is you because most of the people you hate don't know it and the others don't care. And Medgar's wife, uh, Merle, has spoken out about hate and how consuming it can be. And tragically, she had to deal with it firsthand um, because Medgar was assassinated. Now, I need to pause here a little bit, too, and to say that not every family wound is, is abusive and traumatic in nature. And on the, on the flip side of that, it's sad how just those, those little incidences can, can add up when it comes to family and how it can still lead to a lot of emotional pain and difficulty. So also when we're struggling with family pain or, or any pain for that matter, we need to lay it at God's feet. This means having hard prayers with specific details. In all of our prayers, God wants to hear from us, and he welcomes us to go deep with him. We need to open our hearts to him and go beyond the surface of, help me to forgive my, my dad or my mom or my brother or my sister, to, to something a bit deeper like, I feel so hurt by what happened. This is what happened. This is, this is how it has impacted me, and this is how I'm struggling with it. 
In Psalm 42, verse 4, David uses this phrase, and I'm pulling it out of context a little bit. He says, I pour out my soul. Uh, we sing this phrase in the, in the song, As the Deer, the, the newer version that we've learned. As we talked about earlier this quarter, as we've seen in Psalms, God wants us to pour out our soul to him, to bring it all to him. And, and in some ways, that's going to be just a painful uh, conversation, of just laying it at God's feet. Two more thoughts on this, both from Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. First, God wants you to forgive. We see this as he instructs, uh, after Jesus instructs his apostles about how to pray, he finishes that, uh, that section by saying, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 through 15, For if you forgive others their tras trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Remember how Reuben puts it. He says that they sinned against Joseph. Now, God is able to forgive sin, and it's a heaven, heavenly calling for us to do likewise. Secondly, God wants you to reconcile. Um, from earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the fire of hell. The hell of fire, excuse me. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Now, Jesus uses the term brother in this passage, and I usually read this to mean my Christian brother or sister, or my brother man. Uh, but it certainly can and should apply to our physical family as well. And to be clear, this passage refers to if a brother has something against you and, and not the other way around. But it says a lot about how destructive hate can be, and it doesn't even use the word hate in this passage. When you're struggling with family, it's easy to get mad. It's easy to start brooding, to start just thinking about it all the time. And before you know it, you're down a path that is the opposite of how Paul describes love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as being patient and kind and keeping no record of wrongs. Suddenly, it's easier to fly off the handle and you bring out a, a whole list of times when someone did you wrong. Okay, so back to Joseph for a minute. Joseph was willing to leave his family in the past, but God had more in mind. God was working for the salvation of Jacob's family from the famine, to establish the nation of Israel, and to eventually bring Jesus to earth. And Joseph's compassion towards his family will become part of the story of salvation as a result. But God also provided the opportunity for reconciliation for this family. And as we're going to be looking at in the next two weeks, it's still going to be a bumpy road, but we all know it has a happy ending. So God healed Joseph's pain and his family wounds. And for you, if you're struggling with that uh, this morning, I want you to know that he can heal yours as well. Okay, um, let me see if there's any more comments. Again, this, is, this was more of like a, a, a very uh, personal uh, thought and lesson this morning. Uh, I, it is so good to see you all here uh, saying good morning. Again, it reminds me of, of the wonderful sound, the joyous sound uh, of, of us all um, talking as we're, as we're entering the auditorium. It's, it's kind of fun to see that virtually. Thank you again for being here this morning. Uh, just a way of reminder, uh, if you have uh, children uh, in the first through sixth grade, Lori is going to be uh, hosting a class here on this channel as well. Uh, in at the bottom of the hour in a few minutes and then I'm looking forward to worshiping with you all at the top of the hour take care